Let's begin with prayer, huh? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Dear gracious and heavenly Father, we give you thanks this day that we are able to come together as brothers and sisters in Christ. For the skills and abilities you have given Dr. Susan Mobley and, and the presentation we are about to receive, we ask your blessing upon this information that is presented to us that we can use it to the glory of your name and the benefit of your kingdom. We ask you to be with us today and those who aren't able to be with us today, keep them strong and steadfast. In your son's precious name, Amen. Amen. I, I decided um, to talk about the, the, the situation of Luther in 1521 at the Diet of Worms, um, not just uh, from a theological perspective, but also from um, you know, the, political, the political religious context of the day. Because what we see Luther doing at the Diet of Worms um, is an act of courage, um, but what I would like to argue is that courage came from his conscience, which comes from the grace of God. So 1517 um, is normally the banner year for the Reformation, and in 2017 we celebrated the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. We Lutherans got all excited about it. Mm -hmm. um, but I'd like to argue that in some ways 1521 is a more significant date for the Reformation. Um, not only because I think Luther had a, a, a more uh, developed sense of his, um, the, his theology, but um, I, in some ways it's like a, a point of no, turn, of no turning back. Once, once we have the Diet of Worms, there's only one direction that we can go. Um, so that's kind of what I want to unpack a little bit um, today. And I know that you have been doing some work already on Reformation topics, so I, I'm going to try not to go over the same ground. Um, so I'm not going to talk a lot about Luther or the indulgence controversy, but I, I want to put it up here just so we have the, the Diet of Worms in context. Um, so the important thing to remember about Luther here is he has a doctorate in theology. Now, even today, um, PhDs are uh, fairly rare. Only a small percentage of the population has them. It, it was even rarer in the 16th century. So someone who had a doctorate in any field um, actually was elevated socially. Um, so Luther comes from really a middle class background, but his, his doctorate sort of elevated him where he could, um, you know, talk to lords and princes, if not on an even level, um, certainly not on, from a subservient level. So that's kind of important to understand. Um, when Luther said something, he was speaking as a doctor of theology. Um, so I think you've probably um, covered some of this already, the indulgence controversy. Um, has anyone been to uh, St. Peter's in Rome? Okay, uh, this is actually my picture. Uh, I took a group of students there um, a few years ago. <laughs> so uh, we, walked in, we walked in the uh, cathedral and um, my first thought was, wow, it's gorgeous. My second thought was, it's no wonder we had a reformation. Um, because the, um, the indulgence controversy, right, is started with this jubilee indulgence and the main point of that was to um, build a new cathedral for the church in Rome. And it is stupendous, um, but also very expensive. So, um, this occasioned all kinds of problems, and we have to remember that the people were already not very happy with the church hierarchy. Um, there were a lot of, um, if you have any of you have read Chaucer, he has a very lot of negative things to say about the clergy, Erasmus, uh, lampoons the clergy. So the, the people are not very happy with the clergy at this moment in time. Um, and I think that's probably mainly because they're more aware um, of religious things and that has to do with the invention of the printing press in the middle of the 15th century and rising literacy among the laity. So a lot of this is then coming to a head um, with Luther in the early part of the 16th century. Uh, and there's another uh, ex significant political event with the accession of Charles V as Holy Roman Emperor and I'm going to get to that uh, a little bit later. Okay, so um, Luther, um, the, the 95 Theses um, are really, um, even though they were translated into German, Luther originally wrote them in Latin. And what it re really was is a call for debate. This was a, a usual practice among universities of the day. It, and if you think about it, you know, paper was actually really expensive. So a lot of the, um, a lot of the assessments that students would have to complete were not written papers, but they were oral. So um, it was very typical for professors to, to model how debate, how disputations um, should be conducted. So this is exactly what Luther was doing with his 95 theses. Um, he had 95 points that he was willing to debate <clears throat> all comers. Um, but s since um, he sort of touched on a resonant chord um, with a lot of the people, so that someone got a hold of his theses in Latin, translated them in German because of the printing press, um, they're able to be spread pretty broadly. Um, this 
Um, initially, you know, the Pope um, thinks it's just a, it's a controversy among um, monastics. A lot of his um, opponents were Dominicans. He's an Augustinian. So he thought it was just another dispute among the, the monastic orders. I'm just going to stay out of it. Um, but when it spread beyond sort of uh, clerical circles, uh, then he um, had to pay attention. And what we eventually get is a papal bull in 1520 called Exurge Domine. Um, papal bulls are always written in Latin. I think, I, think, I think they still are. I think they still are written in Latin. And they are normally named after the first couple of words in the papal bull. So Exurge Domine is arise, O Lord. Um, so I, w I wanted to point out just a couple of things about what the Pope is reacting to um, from some of the things that Luther had been saying. Um, again, we're, we're seeing the papacy as, um, right? So the popes claim authority over the church because they claim to have apostolic succession from Peter. Mm -hmm. So if you remember, um, Christ says to Peter, you are my rock, on this rock I will, I will build my church. So that is the origins for that claim. It's called the Petrine Doctrine. Uh, and that is the origin for papal claims to authority over the church is the apostolic succession through Peter. Um, so this is how he's viewing himself. But um, you see, do you see what he's saying here? The wild boar from the forest seeks to destroy it and every wild beast feeds upon it. The wild boar is Luther. <laughs> That's how he's calling Luther, is the wild boar. Okay. So, the issue is how to interpret scripture. So, what Luther is saying is uh, that, and, and I, I will, I'm going to talk about his treatises of 1520 in just a second, but a, a lot of the, the essential debate about the Reformation is truth. What is the ultimate source of truth? For Luther, it was found in God's word. Um, for the Pope and the church hierarchy, um, it was the scripture but combined with some other things, including the, the Pope as the head of the church. So am I, am I saying the way, can everyone see? Can everyone see the, the text? Um, okay. And then, again, it's, um, they're seeing Luther as presenting a danger to the church because he won't accept the authority of the Pope as the sole interpreter of scripture. That's essentially how we start how we start the debate. Um, so that's the papal bull of exorgia. We're, we're not quite yet uh, declaring um, Luther a heretic, but we're getting pretty close. Mm -hmm. So in 1520, then um, Luther wrote three treatises, and I want to walk through um, very briefly um, all three because they're very significant for understanding what's going on at Worms. Because when he gets to Worms. Um, and the church authorities and the imperial authorities ask him to recant. These are, th these are three main items they want him to toss. They, well, he, that they want him to take back everything and he said. So it's, it's, it's worth pausing for a minute and talking about what exactly he said. Um, so, and they're all different types. So we have the address to the Christian nobility of the German nation. And you'll notice that this was written in German. Now, can anyone tell me why that's significant? Why writing a treatise in German is significant? So they can read it. Who can read it? The people. The people. The laity, right? So even though this is directed at the, the ruling, the ruling elite, they're laity. So he is appealing to them about an issue of religion. So that that division between church and state is going to shift as a result of the Reformation. And here's our first instance that the way in which church and state are going to relate are, are, is going to change. So what Luther says in um, this particular um, treatise is he, he calls upon the nobility um, and basically he says that they bear responsibility for the spiritual well-being of their people. Um, and he, in this, in this treatise, he employs a metaphor and he talks about that the popes in the church hierarchy had, had, had put up three walls to prevent uh, reform of the church. Um, the first wall, that only the priesthood constitutes a spiritual estate, and they are worthier than other Christians. The clergy, by their very definition of being clerical, are somehow closer to God than the laity. Oh, Luther rejects that. The second wall, that the church with the Pope as its head stands as a sole authority over interpreting of Scripture. So again, there's that issue about who can interpret, who can read, who can interpret Scripture. 
The third wall, that the Pope is the supreme head of the church and that church councils must be called and ratified by the Pope. So historically, when um, we had a problem with the Pope, there, there, there isn't a mechanism for removing it. Um, the only mechanism there might be is a church council, which represents the body of the faithful. But the problem there is that in order to get a church council, the Pope has to call it. So if your problem is with the Pope, you, you see the problem? So um, Luther's saying we, the, he rejects this as well. So he, um, he is really challenging a lot of the ways that the church had functioned for centuries. Okay, so that's the address to the um, Christian ability of the German nation. The second one is on the Babylonian captivity of the church. This one is written in Latin. So that tells you that his audience is different. Um, this happens to be a more theologically complex work, and so it's definitely aimed at an educated clerical elite. Once again, Luther here is drawing upon scripture. He's drawing upon scripture um, as a foundation for his criticisms of some of the things that he's seeing in um, Catholic doctrine and practice. Uh, in particular, he's going after scholastic theology. Um, and to explain that, would probably, like take three hours, so we're just gonna, we're gonna skip that. Um, but he, um, Luther is, um, he's really a vivid writer. Um, and he, he, he succeeds in, in conjuring up images in your mind when you read him. So he compares the condition of Christendom to the captivity of the Jews in Babylon, as it's recorded in the Old Testament. So in this, in this on the Babylonian captivity, he is completely <coughs> rejecting the entire medieval penitential um, sacramental system. So if, um, maybe we should pause for just a second and talk about that system. So if, um, since the Fourth Lateran Council of 1215, um, the sacraments of the Catholic Church had been formalized at seven. Do we know the seven sacraments? Can we name them? Can we name the seven sacraments? Marriage. 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 Baptism. Baptism. Lord's Supper. Lord's Supper. Last rites. Last rites. Mm -hmm. Confession. Confession, absolution, penance. Uh, Ordination. The ordination and is it usury? No. Confirmation. Confirmation. Okay. So if you look at those seven sacraments, they mark the major stage of your life. Baptism occurs at birth. Confirmation occurs in adolescence. Um, and then a little bit older, you're either ordained or you're married. Um, then you have. Um, Confession, absolution, penance is, is continual. It happens all the time. And then last rites happen before death. So the way the medieval penitential system worked is it marked every stage of a person's life. Um, we have to remember that in the medieval system, um, grace could only be had from the church. Salvation could only come from the church, and it came through the sacraments, which they believe actually conferred grace. So L Luther is attacking all of that. So the, ent the entire way in which um, faith and practice and Catholic doctrine work for centuries, Luther is challenging um, because he doesn't find a scriptural basis for what they're doing. Um, so he argues that the sacraments were not efficacious works of the believer and visible signs of conferring of divine grace, but were instead rites that combined a divine promise with a sacramental sign that served as a reminder of that promise. So he views the sacraments in a completely different way. Um, so eventually he's going to go from seven to two sacraments. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> what does it mean that the sacraments are not efficacious works of the Lord? In the medieval system, um, in scholastic theology, it was a belief that um, if you did the best one could, that God would, would reward you with, with grace. So in other words, it, it's, they clarified this a little bit at Trent, but it, it was the sense that you had to prepare yourself to be worthy to receive grace. So there was something that you had to do as an individual to be, to be prepared to receive that grace from God. Was it the slogan, do your best and God will do the rest? That's it. So you had to do these seven, these seven sacraments had to be performed in order for you to be saved? Correct. Okay. Correct. And Luther says, that, yeah, that's not, the, that's not what scripture says. 
So the one I want to talk a little bit about more is On the Freedom of a Christian. This is an interesting one because he wrote it in both languages. He wrote it in Latin and German. Uh, the two translations, I think, are slightly different, but uh, the message is the same. So what happened is, you know, if you look at the, those, those first two treatises, you know, he's attacking the medieval penitential system. He's attacking the papacy. He's attacking a lot of traditional, um, traditional beliefs. Uh, and he is an Augustinian friar, remember, and the, the leaders of his order got really nervous. Um, about where this was headed. So two of them uh, made a trip to Wittenberg and they asked him in the, in the interest of Christian unity to reconcile with the Pope. So Luther wrote this um, treatise um, and to it he appended a letter to the Pope. The Pope at the time was Leo X and I'm gonna talk about the, the Popes here in just a second. Um, so the letter itself is, uh, and I'll, I'm gonna give you some uh, quotes from it. Um, the letter is very polite, but it's totally unconciliatory. Uh, and in fact, uh, Luther reiterates some of the things that he had said in his other two treatises. And then the, the second part after the letter is an actual treatise and he viewed it as the encapsulation of Christian faith and life. So I, I'm gonna, I wanna walk through a couple of key points um, from that, from that uh, on the freedom of a Christian. Um, so once again, uh, you know, he's, it's kind of like the um, evil counselor's argument. What he's saying, he, what he's saying is, okay, I'm gonna get, Leo, I'm gonna give you the benefit of the doubt. Uh, I'm sure you're a great guy and you're just being led astray by the people around you. But let's face it, Rome is a cesspool. Uh, and that's essentially what he says. So if we look at the very last part of this, um, for many years now, nothing else has overflowed from Rome into the world, as you are not ignorant, than the laying waste of goods, of bodies, and of souls, and the worst examples of all the worst things. These things are clearer than the light to all men, and the Church of Rome, formerly the most holy of all churches, has become the most lawless den of thieves, the most shameless of all brothels, the very kingdom of sin, death, and hell, so that not even Antichrist, if he were to come, could devise any addition to its wickedness. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Wow, right. Them is fighting words. Okay. <laughs> so he continues and he's like, you know, look, you know, he says to Leo, uh, you know, you got to be careful about listening to the people around you. They're, they're flattering you. They're, they're, they're telling you things that aren't true because they want something. It works to their advantage if you believe this stuff. So he warns, he, he reminds the Pope, you are the servant of servants and more than any other man in a most pitiable and perilous position. Let not those men deceive you who pretend that you are Lord of the world, who will not allow anyone to be a Christian without your authority, who babble of your having power over hell, heaven, hell, and purgatory. These men are your enemies and are seeking your soul to destroy it. As Isaiah says, my people that they call thee blessed are themselves deceiving thee. They are an error who raise you above councils and the universal church. They are an error who attribute to you alone the right of interpreting scripture. There we are again. All these men are seeking to set up their own impieties in the church under your name. And alas, Satan has gained much through them in the time of your predecessors. So he's, he's offering Leo the chance to, um, to correct the, the trajectory um, of, the, of the church. So in the, in the uh, second part, so the actual treatise itself, that was from the letter that was directed to uh, Leo. Um, his thesis in the, on the freedom of a Christian is this. A Christian is a perfectly free lord of all, subject to none. A Christian is a perfectly dutiful servant of all, subject to all. So when he's talking about Christian liberty, what he's talking about is freedom from the law um, through grace um, for, because of Christ. So that he says that's all that's needful. So in this, he says a couple of things. Uh, there will be a quiz in just a second because I'm going to ask you, what is it that he's saying that's going to upset the authorities? He says, not only are we the freest of kings, we are also priests forever, which is far more excellent than being kings. For as priests, we are worthy to appear before God, to pray for others, and to teach one another divine things. Okay, so what is he saying there? His office is higher than the king. We're just as good as you. And as individual believers, what is our responsibility? To pray. To pray, to teach, to share the faith with others, right? 
And we don't have to depend upon the clergy to do that. All of us bear that responsibility. Um, and it's a, it's a gift, right? It's a gift uh, because of grace. So Christ ought to be preached to the end that faith in him may be established, that he may not only be Christ, but be Christ for you and me, and that what is said of him and is denoted in his name may be effectual in us. This is done when that Christian liberty which he bestows is rightly taught, and we are told in what way we Christians are all kings and priests, and therefore lords of all, and may firmly believe that whatever we have done is pleasing and acceptable in the sight of God. So the, the calling for the individual Christian then is to be is to serve one another. So um, a lot of Luther's thought um, is um, sometimes they talk about a dualism in his theology. Um, I tend to think that's because he was influenced by Augustine. Um, so in this last part of the Freedom of Christian, he talks about the inner and the outer man, right? Um, so basically, that's another way of thinking about um, the, the spiritual and the temporal, right? And if you if you think about what Paul says, you know, I, I want to do good, but but I don't. And, and what I you know I want to I want to say the something good and I, I say something bad. So there's that inner tension in each individual each individual soul. Um, so th that's the same sort of thing that Augustine was talking about when he talked about the city of God and the city of man, right? The city of man is the world in which we live here. Uh, we're pilgrims, right? Pilgrims. Uh, but we are simultaneously, thank you, thank you. Uh, we are simultaneously citizens of the city of God, again, through grace. But there, because we live in this world, there's that tension. We, we know what we should do, but we almost always don't do what we're supposed to do, which is, of course, why we need grace. Um, so, this is, so this is one of the ways I think that, August, that uh, Luther is, is sort of taking Augustine's idea of the city of man, the city of God, and, and, and talking about the inner and the outer man. Okay, so now here's your quiz. What is it that Luther is saying that is so upsetting to the authorities of his day? Scripture has authority and not the Pope. The scripture is the foundation of authority and not the Pope, okay? Priesthood of all believers. Wait a minute. We're special. We're the clergy. Okay? Anything faith else? Faith is obtained by grace, not by works. Faith is obtained by grace, not by works. It seems like in the, in the 95 Theses, he's actually, in the first couple, he's calling uh, in the question the whole Jerome translation of the Latin Vulgate, right? He has some issues. He has some issues with uh, Jerome's vault. It's actually, a, it's actually a lovely translation, but there are a couple. Of, okay, I digress. Um, all right. So uh, I want to talk about then how, um, what the authorities of the day are, and I think that will help you when you when we get to the Diet of Worms and we, and we see what Luther is doing there. We can understand the significance. Um, okay. So let me walk you through the authorities of the day. I'm going to do, I'm going to do the Renaissance papacy in pictures. Um, so the. Um, the, the Renaissance papacy was a series of popes from the, the latter part of the 15th century, um, well actually um, from 1417 um, up until the, the, the Reformation period. Um, what we have happening in the Renaissance papacy is um, you have a series of popes who come from very important Italian families and what they are seeing the papacy is as a foundation to advance their own, the interests of their own family. So uh, I have three examples here. Alexander VI is the one on the far left. Okay, so what is, what is he saying about himself in this portrait? Um, there's a certain thing of piety about it. He's, he's kneeling down and he's praying. He's, he's kneeling down, he, so his posture is pious. Look at how he's dressed. Very, very elegant. He's got a jewel he's got a jewel encrusted cloak, right? So he has the posture of humility, but he's not dressed like he's humble, right? Um, Alexander the Sixth was um, known for advancing the careers of his children. <laughs> Did anyone notice a problem with what I just said? <laughs> so not only does he have children, he acknowledges them, right? So uh, one of them is Cesare Borgia. 
And the other one is Lucretia Borgia. You may have heard um, of, of, of the two. So, I mean, already that's a problem. Uh, I, had to, I had to include this, this modern photo of, of the next pope because I actually couldn't find one of him in armor. Uh, this is Julius II, <laughs> who was known as the warrior pope. So I thought that the, the modern reenactor kind of captured that spirit pretty well. Uh, okay, what's the problem there? Coming as a warrior. Okay, so that's a problem because... That's, that's, not the <laughs> that's not what popes are supposed to be doing, right? They're supposed to be shepherds and the spiritual leaders, you know, not warriors defending the territory of the church. Okay. And then the last image is Leo X. Uh, Leo X was a Medici. Have anyone heard of the Medici from Renaissance Florence? So very important um, family. Um, and so they're, basically the point I'm trying to make is that Really, the Renaissance popes, their, their main focus was on temporal affairs. They were more interested in politics than they were interested in spiritual affairs. And this is a problem, particularly if you claim to be the head of the church. Um, so then the other authority, so that's, uh, the, the papacy is, there are two universal authorities in medieval Europe. The papacy is one of them. What, what I mean by that is his authority um, is binding everywhere. Right? It doesn't matter if you're in Italy or if you're in Germany or if you're in England. The Pope's authority covers everybody. The other universal authority of the Middle Ages was the Holy Roman Empire. <clears throat> um, now, the Holy Roman Empire is kind of an interesting thing. It's neither holy nor Roman nor an empire, but we're, we're kind of stuck with the label. Uh, and I'm going to show you some maps in just a second. Um, but um, it is, the, the heart of it is in German-speaking areas, but it does include people who are non-Germans. But it's marked by something called regional particularism. And actually, this goes way back uh, into the dim mists of the Teutonic past. Um, the Germans actually um, have, have always kind of favored a federated system. Um, and that what we have here is, um, you know, you have different principalities. There's actually over 300 of them, and they're each um, they each have authority in their own little in their own little neck of the woods. Well, that makes sense because every time the Germans unite as one, they they fight the whole world. <clears throat> Yeah, so the German unification is actually the exception, not 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 the rule. Okay. Uh, and then the, the major family we're going to be talking about here are the Habsburgs, and they're based in, in Austria, um, in Vienna, um, and they also have um, a, a base in Spain. And that's going to be significant for politics of the 16th century. So according to the Golden Bull of 1356, um, so again, we're doing this German elective, um, elective monarchy thing. Uh, the emperors are not emperors because of dynastic succession you know, from father to son. A lot of times that's the way it works, but that's not really the, that's not really the way it is. They're, they're elected. So there are seven electors. Do, what do you notice significant about the seven electors? Rome, Saxony, Archbishop. Do you notice that three of them are, are clerical and four are secular? Isn't that weird? Um, not if you're the Holy Roman Empire. Um, so this was typically, so every time we, we had to, uh, uh, to, elect an, to, to elect an emperor, the, the seven electors would gather and they would, uh, usually there's a lot of debate, bribery uh, going on for who was going to get the crown. And this is particularly the case at the beginning part of the 16th century.